When a daughter put a scorpion in her mother's coffin, something shocking happened. Heather Quinn Bryant, Eliza's estranged mother, had been pronounced dead in her hospice bed six days ago on the 2nd of October. Salem, the city in which she was born and raised, would soon be the very place she would be put to rest. It is said that she passed peacefully, surrounded by a number of friends and family, all of whom shared a love for Heather that was far stronger than Eliza had ever experienced. She followed her husband, Jim Bryant, in death. The mother of two had been diagnosed with an aggressive, untreatable form of brain cancer just two years prior at the age of 56. Despite being the textbook picture of health her entire life, Heather had sat in her doctor's office that fateful day in denial, holding MRI scans that pointed to the tumor rapidly growing in her frontal lobe. She was initially given eight months to live, with Eliza on the opposite side of Massachusetts and her eldest daughter Ava on the opposite side of the country, the only option was for Heather to be placed in a home where she could be cared for by those who knew her best. When Eliza was made aware of the prognosis, she was ashamed that within her sadness, she could not find comfort in the idea that the strain of their mother-daughter relationship would soon no longer exist, nor have the ability to tread on her sanity. Her relationship with her mother, Heather, had been nothing but turbulent, marked by years of unresolved conflicts and hateful grievances. The comparison between her and her older sister only served to intensify the sheer bitterness that festered within Eliza. Eliza's resentment roots back to her childhood when she realized her parents favored having just one child, making her feel unwanted. Her mother in particular showed no interest in her. Eliza struggled with her identity and endured a neglectful upbringing, marked by a sense of being an unwanted accident. Heather's favoritism towards Rebecca highlighted how Eliza was considered an afterthought by her mother, disrupting the illusion of a perfect family. The constant comparisons, dismissive attitude, and clear preference for Ava fueled Eliza's animosity and a deep-seated confusion about why she felt incapable or undeserving of love throughout her entire life. As the sisters matured, their paths diverged significantly. Ava thrived under their mother's approval, excelling in sports and academics. She effortlessly pursued conventional success and earned the place at Stanford University with a prestigious volleyball scholarship. Contrastingly, Eliza rebelled against her mother's expectations and sought solace in creating her own narrative. She immersed herself in various forms of creative expression from a young age, nurturing a passion for visual design, theater, literature, and music. After graduating from Boston University with an English degree, she chose a peaceful life as a local artist and museum tour guide in Stockbridge. That was, of course, until now. Eliza settled into the quiet of her own grief. She wrapped herself tightly in the warmest coat she could find, knowing that no amount of warmth would be able to soothe the chill that had settled in her bones. She had sworn to never return to Salem, to never pay respects to a woman responsible for that much pain, and yet Eliza found herself standing on the very pathway her parents had watched her take her first steps. Returning for her mother's funeral had done nothing but flood her mind with the repressed memories and unresolved questions she had moved so far away to forget. It was then that the door slammed shut behind her, a tired voice posing an unwanted question. Are you ready? Eliza turned to face her older sister, meeting a glassy stare. Ava had not responded as well as she had to the loss, which was evident by the hollows of her eyes. Eliza tried to offer a smile, but could only manage to shake her head in response. Ava came to her side and without another word, the sisters started down the sidewalk. Neither could manage a conversation, so they cast their eyes downward, both out of respect as well as in an effort to ignore the church they were marching so assuredly toward. The town, with its aging streets and faces, felt as comforting as it did suffocating. Salem had frozen completely in time, every corner threatening to expose a fragment of a long-forgotten past. As they approached, the church's bells rang with such force that to Eliza it was now undeniable and hard to ignore their loss. When they arrived at the wooden front doors, Ava came to a halt. She had frozen and was staring blankly into the wood, as if willing the doors to swing open themselves. For a split second, this stunned Eliza into inaction. Her older sister had always been the one to take the first step, and after a beat of silence, Eliza took a step forward and pushed the entrance door open herself. The two cautiously stepped foot inside the ancient structure, one following the other. 
Ava, who was still frozen in shock, let out a choked sob as Eliza led her to the altar. The air seemed to still as they stood before her casket, a vessel that now held the remains of the woman who had shaped their lives in such drastically different ways. A chill ran down Eliza's spine. A large portrait of Heather that had been taken by Eliza sat framed on a table next to the coffin. She recognized her handwriting etched in the corner, lines sketched to form the faint image of a small scorpion. Eliza Akrep Bryant shared the same middle name as her father, but a great pride in his Turkish culture. The word Akrep could be directly translated to the word scorpion. Eva Monroe Bryant, on the other hand, shared the same middle name as her mother. At the time of the portrait, Eliza had used her middle name Akrep as a signature and would leave small scorpions on any art she happened to be creating. She viewed it as her small act of defiance, to honor her father's name instead of her mother's. She eventually grew out of the signature as she matured. A number of other photos were scattered around, painting the life of a beautiful and talented woman, but Eliza knew immediately that this one had only been placed for her. It was a message from beyond the grave, her mother sending a final message to Ava, that she had known about the meaning of her defined signature all along, and most importantly, she had never cared enough to say anything about it. Though it was especially fitting, Eliza thought, considering that a live scorpion was waiting to be released from the bag she had been clunging so tightly since they had left the house. The bark scorpion, an unsuspecting yet formidable foe, bore a distinctive pale yellow color with dark stripes running along its back. She had chosen it strictly due to its poisonous nature. Its slender body and delicate pincers concealed the deadly venom housed in its tail, a symbol of the silent but lethal forces that had defined her tumultuous relationship with Heather. The small creature confined in the bag seemed to mirror the same emotions Eliza harbored, restrained, potent, and desperate to be released into the world. The sisters shared a moment of silence. Eliza hesitated for a moment, her hand hovering over the cold surface before gently resting on the polished wood of her mother's coffin. Ava, standing beside her, echoed the silent acknowledgement. Her older sister had never been anything more than the embodiment of strength, resilient, unemotional, a pillar of unwavering support. Yet in this sacred space, even Ava's steadfast composure began to falter. The lines of her face softened, and a vulnerability surfaced from the depths of her unyielding gaze. The sister, who had always been the epitome of control, now found herself grappling with raw, unfiltered emotion that threatened to tear the breath from her lungs. I'll give you a moment, Eliza said, as she took a step back to allow Ava a space to regain her composure. Ava turned to look at her and quickly shook her head, now on the verge of tears. No, I can't, she whispered. Her voice caught in her throat and suddenly she felt the overwhelming need to escape the confines of the church and quickly distanced herself from the reality she found herself in. A quiet understanding passed between them, and without uttering another word, Ava turned away from the polished casket and walked towards the heavy wooden doors, each step carrying the weight of the grief threatening to swallow her whole. When the doors had shut and she was sure Ava had left, Eliza couldn't help but to feel like a child again, painfully alone as she stood before her mother, even in death. Heather had left Eliza wanting and expecting a love that would never come. She carefully placed her shoulder bag on the floor and opened it to reveal a singular jar. Within it lay a small scorpion that measured out only two and a half inches. She removed the jar from her bag, careful to disturb the creature any further than she already had, before opening her mother's casket and placing it inside. Eliza didn't have the stomach to spare more than a passing glance at her mother's face which had been covered gracefully in a white lace handkerchief, before shutting the casket for good. The following morning, the church was packed shoulder to shoulder as people arrived and shuffled into the pews. Ava sat in the front row, facing the right end of the coffin. She appeared stoic and unflinching, even as passing faces continued to express their grievances. In order to avoid the growing crowd, Eliza didn't plan on staying long after the service so she had situated herself towards the back for an easy getaway. Distancing herself from the scorpion also made it easier to ignore the nagging guilt gnawing at the edges of her conscience. Though Eliza didn't regret her decision, she could feel the weight of her symbolic act pressing down on her. As the church quieted to nothing but a whisper, 
Ava cast a sidelong glance in the Eliza's direction, perhaps sensing the storm of her conflicting emotions. Soon, though, her attention was brought back to the front as the clergyman began to speak, the timbre of his voice drawing attention to the beginning of their mother's funeral. As the service continued to unfold, Ava's composed demeanor seemed to waver. Her eyes, once fixated on the casket, now flickered with uncertainty. When it came time to share her eulogy, Ava hesitated, once more glancing back at her sister before making her way to the front of the church. The carefully chosen words she had prepared now hung in the balance. I stand here today not only to mourn the passing of a woman who shaped our lives but also to honor the complexity and beauty of her character. Ava began, her voice carrying an honesty that resonated through the hallowed space. Her eyes welled with tears and she paused searching for the strength to continue. But first, I have decided that in her memory, we will have an open casket, a last-minute choice, but one made with the intention of giving each and every one of us the opportunity to say a final goodbye. Eliza's heart dropped. A murmur of surprise rippled through the congregation as the declaration hung in the air. Mourners exchanged uncertain glances, feeling a heavy shift within the already tense atmosphere of the church. Eliza felt a knot forming in her stomach as she anticipated the consequences of her impulsive decision. There was nothing she could do now but watch. Ava approached the casket and reached for the latch securing it shut. As the polished wood opened to reveal the figure within, her face paled in horror. Eliza's heart raced, and she felt a surge of powerlessness as the unfolding events escaped her control. In an attempt to explain and run damage control, she rushed from her seat toward Ava. It was only when she reached Ava's side, however, that she noticed something was terribly, terribly wrong. The scorpion was where she had left it the night before, but the woman lying in the casket was not their mother. Horror quickly became shock and confusion, both daughters grappling with the scene in front of them and unable to say anything in their disbelief. A stranger lay before them in death, dressed in their mother's clothes and treasured jewels. As the crowd registered the daughters' responses, the air thickened with a tangible sense of panic. Within minutes, the already crowded church had become a cluster of confusion, with many trying to catch a glance of the coffin to confirm what would soon be known as true. Her body was missing. As people were escorted out of the company, whispers of scandal and incompetence had already begun to buzz through the crowd. The scorpion's presence, a silent witness to the unfolding chaos, added another layer of surrealism to the already bewildering scene. Once a symbolic object in a misguided farewell, the creature now seemed like a cruel joke, a silent instigator in a drama that had spiraled out of control. Ava's grief had quickly given way to an anger so intense that not even Eliza had dared to intervene. The funeral organizers were unable to look Ava in the eye as she stormed towards them, seething with anger and begging the question on everyone's mind. Where is Heather? To no surprise, the professionals who had been responsible for their mother in death could not form a sure answer. The only valuable piece of information they managed to divulge is that the casket had been transported from a funeral home located in the south side of Boston. That same evening, Eliza and Ava found themselves in an uncomfortable silence as they navigated the cramped streets of downtown Boston. The trip to the funeral home had led the sisters to an unfamiliar place that neither had ventured before. It had nestled deep within a small neighborhood that exuded an air of neglect with rotting buildings and flickering streetlights casting long shadows across the uneven pavement. Eliza couldn't shake the feeling that the place they were approaching held more than just the answer to where their mother's body was at. Upon entering the funeral home, the sisters were greeted by the owner, a disheveled man, who greeted them with an air of indifference. He led them through dimly lit corridors lined with floral wallpaper that had yellowed in age, and into a room with fluorescent bulbs that cast a sickly glow on what appeared to be his makeshift office. The funeral home, which was dirty and smelled faintly of decay, made it impossible to believe that this had been the setting for the final farewell of a woman like Heather Quinn Bryant. The owner showed little sympathy as he fumbled with paperwork and mumbled poor excuses. Eliza, torn between a need for answers and the unsettling environment, found herself questioning who had made the decision to entrust their mother's final moments to such an unprofessional establishment, if you could even call it an establishment at all. In a moment of grotesque negligence, he admitted to accidentally switching the bodies. The owner, indifferent to the gravity of the situation, continued his haphazard explanations. 
but nothing he could say would change the fact that Heather Quinn Bryant, a woman who had been so deeply loved by her community, now lay 200 miles away, destined for an unplanned and premature cremation. After securing this information, the girls left without another word and returned to their vehicle. Ava placed a call to the crematorium, whose number had been written down hurriedly on a yellow sticky note, and after speaking to a few different individuals, she was finally able to locate her mother's body. After yet another journey, Ava and Eliza reached the crematorium. In its blank, quiet corridors is where the sister would soon find closure. Their mother lay inside of the casket she was meant to be buried in, the harsh overhead lights giving an almost ethereal glow to her face. Despite what events had transpired, she looked more peaceful than ever. The stress of life had finally released its hold on her. After being transported back to Salem, Heather was finally put to rest at her proper burial site on October 10th, surrounded by those who loved and cherished her most. This time no scorpion was present, only a grieving daughter who just this once had managed to find peace. One by one, the onlookers had paid their respects and left, until it was just Ava and Eliza standing next to the open grave. The sisters, their hearts now burdened with a different kind of heaviness, could finally challenge the inevitability of moving forward taking solace in the fact that their mother was now properly laid to rest. As we conclude this gripping journey, the tale of this family's unconventional farewell leaves us to reflect on the unpredictable twists life can throw our way. Could you see a scenario like this ever happening to you? Or do you think this is a story confined strictly to the realms of our imagination? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, remember to question the stories that unfold around you. Stay curious, stay captivated, and stay questioning.